And that leaves us with really a lot of questions. You mentioned Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done. That is a kind of 19th century programmatic novel that hopes to show that a kind of cooperative factory mm -hmm. system would be the way to the future. Mm -hmm. It actually kind of gives an answer to the mm -hmm. question, what is to be done? Lucien in RQ doesn't really do That's that very right. much. That's an interesting thing about Chernyshevsky, it focuses around a woman who escapes an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's also about women's situation being changed and being key, which the new youth people really believe. They have mm -hmm. a lot of essays mm -hmm. on feminism and on things like the evils of foot binding and also women should be able to cut their hair short mm -hmm. so they can have a more practical life. All of that is there in Chernyshevsky and they have this interest. But Lucien is really probing the, the limits of what yeah. can happen. And in this sense, he's also rewriting, I think, Voltaire's Candide. So in some way, Q is a Candide figure. He's an innocent, or he's a cross between Voltaire's Candide and Rousseau's natural man. He satisfies his wants. He's almost not moral, not amoral. Mm. He asks someone to sleep with him just when he feels like it. He takes food when he needs it. Mm. It's not a really moral issue. It's much like the Rousseau in the state of nature. But he's a candid figure. He goes through these misadventures yeah, and always yeah. sort of thinks for the best. Late in the story, when he's being forced to sign this false confession, we read, he didn't in truth feel too badly about things. In the rich tapestry that is life, he considered the man is destined sometimes to be hauled out and other times shoved in, other times draw circles on paper. He doesn't know how to write. He's being asked right. to sign a confession he can't actually read, and trying to write Q is an imperfect circle. And then a couple of pages later, at the end of the story, he's being taken off to be executed. And he thinks to himself, was he on his way to an execution? He suddenly wondered. His vision began to darken, his ears to buzz, as if he were about to faint in panic. Yet he remained conscious, veering between fear, calm, and the dawning sense that in the rich tapestry of life, a man is destined sometimes to have his head cut off. <laughs> yes. So he's trying to think like Pangloss and mm -hmm. Candide. It's really the best of all possible worlds, yes. even when my own head is about to be cut off. And the last chapter is called A Happy Ending, mm -hmm. and that's going to be the ending. And what's so interesting, if you think about it, to me that it's a little bit like Rousseau's critique of Voltaire. Voltaire was wealthy enough, he's well-connected enough, he could afford a certain kind of satiric distance and sort of mm. elegant melancholy. Lucian is in this village. And in fact, the village is where it said is his own hometown. The revolutionaries come and take over on the very day his own hometown had been taken over mm. by revolutionaries. And in a certain sense, he believes, as a real this sort of darkness of his humor, we don't have a stance outside. Yeah. In Candide, there are these survivors. There's a kind of happy ending. Yes. You cultivate your own garden, you survive. And we're sort of invited to be on the side of Voltaire. Everyone is ridiculous except ourselves if we're on mm -hmm. the side of Voltaire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For Lucien, he's sort of aware as a real, in a modern sense, there isn't that kind of resolution. Yeah. There's a beautiful passage in the preface to his first collection, Outcry, where he published The Diary of a Madman in book form. He's really despairing of making social change, copying his old inscriptions, till his friend comes and says, won't you contribute them to our magazine? And he says, this is what I replied. Imagine an iron house without windows or doors, utterly indestructible, full of sound sleepers, all about to suffocate to death. Let them die in their sleep, and they'll feel nothing. Is it right to cry out, to rouse the light sleepers among them, causing them inconsolable agony before they die? Then his friend replies, but even if we succeed in waking only a few, there is still hope, hope that the Iron House may one day be destroyed. Lucian says he was right. However hard I tried, I couldn't quite obliterate my own sense of hope, because hope is a thing of the future. And I think vis-a-vis -vis Voltaire, or even Chernyshevsky, Lucian thinks or we don't have a utopian space outside. Right. We are in the mm. Iron House, but we can hope for the future. Our outcry now, literature will be this way to wake the sleepers. That's the only hope for a crack of light coming mm. into the Iron House. Mm. A kind of optimism, optimism despite everything, and a an political ambiguity where he doesn't advocate a particular political program, but change of some kind mm -hmm. or another. And I think that ambiguity also shaped his reception history in mm -hmm. China, where he couldn't be just quite seen as a proto-communist later, but he was recognized as a social reformer mm -hmm. and someone who wanted to do away with the old system and the old regime. And that's how he becomes a kind of hyper-canonized figure mm -hmm. now.